Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Stefan Zimmerman. I'm an associate professor uh, here at Johns Hopkins working with Dr. Fishman. And today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, CT evaluation of aortic aneurysms uh, in the postoperative setting. This is going to be a two part lecture. Uh, first part, we're going to talk about endovascular repair, uh, its normal appearance, talk about endo leaks, which is the most common thing we're going to encounter, and then some various other post stent complications. And then the second part, um, we're going to talk about open repair and the various techniques for that, normal post-op findings and complications as well. So generally when we think about aortic repair, we group it into two different types of repair, um, which we just talked about, endovascular repair or EVAR, you may also see TVAR, which is thoracic endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. Um, and in this case, we're putting a stent in the aorta to exclude the aneurysm from blood flow um, using this covered stent, which we'll show. And then the open repair is very simple. Um, that's where you do surgery. You open up the patient. You find the aneurysm. You cut it out, and then you replace it with something else. In this case, or in almost all cases, it's going to be some type of uh, graft material, usually Gore-Tex or Dacron graft. Um, special situations um, for open repair arise when you have actually a graft combined with a valve. So in the ascending aorta, it's not uncommon for somebody to have uh, repair of an aortic valve, or excuse me, replacement of an aortic valve with a prosthetic aortic valve that then also has a portion of ascending aortic graft attached to it. And this is called a composite uh, uh, graft. So in this talk, we're going to review endovascular repair, and this is just a really typical example, nice image showing the concepts behind endovascular repair. Very simple. You have a aneurysm here, a fusiform aneurysm on the left in this coronal MIP image, and then on the right you see what happens after you put the stent in. You have this um, uh, stent uh, with metal struts visualized on CT, and you see that you have blood flow through the stent uh, with contrast, and then the excluded portion of the aneurysm um, is now low in attenuation because there's no blood flow. And so by excluding the aneurysm sac from that blood flow, the aneurysm sac no longer sees that systemic uh, pressure, um, arterial pressure, and so therefore the risk of uh, stent growth, stent rupture, stent, um, excuse me, not stent, aneurysm growth, aneurysm rupture, or aneurysm dissection then goes away. One other thing to point out here is notice that there are a lot of uh, high attenuation blobs in the aneurysm sac. Um, if you look on the left hand image, uh, and the right-hand image, and these are calcifications, not uncommon to get calcifications within the aneurysm sac involving mural thrombus that we often see with these large aneurysms, and something that's going to come up in uh, a couple images when we talk about endoleaks. So this is what you expect to see, normal postoperative findings for from a successful stent placement. That would be you want to see a aneurysm, which in this case at baseline was 6 centimeters, shrink um, to uh, 4.8 centimeters at follow-up. And that's normal, um, and uh, that's a, a good successful aneurysm placement. So uh, there are a whole host of complications, though, that we need to be on the lookout for. And the biggest one, most common one we're going to see is endoleak. So we'll talk about that quite a bit. Um, then the other things are a little less common, changes in stent position, branch vessel compromise, infection, thrombosis. Um, and then not really a complication, but just a note that you always want to make sure you're aware uh, of looking at the whole aorta and not uncommonly one might stent an aneurysm in one place and then realize an aneurysm has developed elsewhere. So just always make sure to, uh, you know, you don't have satisfaction of search that you keep your eye out for aneurysms everywhere in these patients who are prone to forming aneurysms. So endoleaks are really important because they're probably the most common problem we're going to see in these patients who've had endovascular repair. And of the various endoleaks, type 2 um, is going to be the most common. Um, but there are five different types that have been described. Um, one note about type 4, it's called graft wall porosity. This is an endoleak that um, only occurs at the time of stent placement. And um, it's not clinically important. So when they put the stent in, the, pa the um, operator, whether it be your vascular surgeon or your interventional radiologist, they squirt um, some contrast to verify stent positioning, and then you'll see that contrast material leak out through the walls of the stent into the aneurysm sac. That's because when it first goes in, the, gra the wall of the graft is a little bit porous, and then as it sort of, you know, sits there in the body over time, that, that porosity goes away. It becomes a, a solid barrier to blood flow. 
and so therefore there, it really doesn't have any clinical importance of any kind so so more of a curiosity really so but we do care about types one two three and five and we're going to talk about each of those individually so first type one endoleak um, this is an endoleak caused by an incomplete seal of either the proximal or the distal end of the stent so the stent has these um, you know these um, struts and the struts are supposed to press up against the aortic wall to get a nice seal and if they don't because maybe the stent struts or the stent itself is too small poorly sized or maybe because more often of the shape of the aorta and, and the tortuosity of the aorta sometimes if you try to put a straight stent in a curvy aorta you don't really get a good seal uh, against maybe one part of the wall and that allows type 1 endoleak to occur so in this case you've got a gap between the stent and the aortic wall and blood flows around the the um, stent into the aneurysm sac which we, could, which we can see really nicely on this right hand image this is a pretty common picture for a type 1 endoleak in that they not infrequently happen in this location where you have somebody who has stenting of the maybe the distal arch and the proximal descending thoracic aorta and you get this leak along the undersurface of the um, stent and and that's because this is a really tip, tough place to navigate for the stent there's a curve there and again these stents are kind of straight stents that are being tri formed into curves um, and sometimes they just can't really navigate that curve very well and you get this endo leak Another example, this is a distal endoleak, again, a thoracic aortic aneurysm, and you can see that the distal aneurysm sac size is bigger than the, um, than the stent itself, particularly on that right-hand image. I think you can appreciate that. Um, this is a typical type 1 endoleak. So one thing to note, um, type 1 endoleaks generally are not subtle. Um, you're going to see them on the arterial phase images. You're going to um, see them as pretty big. Um, and so, um, and then you're going to find the location to be either proximal or distal. So that's how you identify a type 1 endoleak. Uh, what do you do about a type 1 endoleak? In this case, um, the patient went and got an additional stent. So what you can do is basically you want to make a good seal. Um, so you've got a bad seal. How do you make a good seal? Well, you put another stent in. So that's what was happened in this patient. They put another stent over the previous stent, extended the landing zone a little bit distally where maybe you can get a little better purchase on the aortic wall and, and then they were able to make this um, type 1 endoleak go away. Here's a different example. This is a proximal type 1 endoleak. Again, a very common location to see a type 1 endoleak. And in this case, it was enlarging over time. You can see that aneurysm is quite large um, on that bottom left-hand image, probably over uh, 6 centimeters in diameter. Um, they were not able to extend this uh, stent because we're already in the aortic arch. And so if you extend it more proximally, you're going to cover up important vessels like the common carotid artery and the innominate artery. So, so the options here in the proximal descending thoracic aorta are more limited. And in this case, the patient had to go to open repair, which is shown here. These are post-op pictures from an open repair. Um, just a note, um, I put this case in because this is just, again, an important place to look for people who have um, stents placed in the aortic arch and proximal descending thoracic aorta. It's really a common location for us to see these endoleaks. Um, here's the yellow arrows pointing out on the upper left-hand image. Um, and one other note is that you'll notice that that endoleak seems to be originating not from the very distal aspect or very proximal aspect of the stent, but rather a few centimeters distal to the very proximal end of the stent, and that's normal for some type 1 endoleaks. Many of these stents, the fabric actually doesn't extend all the way to the end of the struts. And that instead, there's actually a portion of the struts that are uncovered. And so in that case, the endoleak, if it, if it exists, will start not, not at the very beginning of the stent, but rather 2 centimeters or 3 centimeters distal to the very beginning of the stent. And that's still considered a type 1 endoleak. So now on to type 2 endoleak, and this brings up um, protocoling. So it's important to note that for complete assessment for endoleak, you really need to have a three-phase exam. Um, and on the right-hand image is sort of why we show this. You, you want to have, we already talked about the arterial phase, how we can really identify type 1 endoleaks, and it turns out type 3 endoleaks as well in the arterial phase. But to identify type 2 endoleaks, you need a non-contrast and a venous phase. And that's because the type 2 endoleaks, these are more subtle. They can often be really um, slow, uh, 
and um, relatively smaller in um, you know in in uh, size than the type one endo leaks, and so some times you won't actually even see them on arterial phase images. You have to wait for a venous phase image to, for them to show up. Right hand image here is a nice example. You've got um, an aneurysm sac, and on the non-contrast images, this is why the non-contrast is important. You see this blob of high attenuation material. So it is present on non-contrast, therefore it is not. Uh, not an endoleak, right? Since it's present on the non-contrast image, we haven't given any um, dye yet. So this is not an endoleak, it's just a calcification. But it's important to have that non-contrast so we can confirm that to be the case. But on the, on the venous phase, we see that that little blob of calcium persists. And then also now we have new um, sort of amorphous blob of contrast in the posterior aspect of the stent on the left side shown by the arrow. And this is very typical for appearance for an endo, type 2 endoleak, in, the, in this case the abdominal aorta. Um, how these endoleaks work is usually you have small branches off of the aorta, um, which then um, in the setting of the stent placement you can have retrograde flow. So whereas instead of carrying blood away from the aorta, they start bringing blood back into the aorta, into the aneurysm sac, and then they serve as this type 2 endoleak. And what that does is it pressurizes the aneurysm sac again, um, and, and so the patient is at risk of rupture um, and other complications. The most common vessels involved <clears throat> in the abdomen, you're going to talk about, you're talking about lumbar arteries and the IMA, which is very common. And in the uh, chest, we're talking about intercostal arteries. And these are important, one, because they can lead to basically poor outcomes, and then two, because you're, um, because they lead to poor outcomes, your uh, vascular surgeons, your IR docs, they're going to treat them. Um, they're going to um, <clears throat> either closely follow them with imaging or they're going to actually try to go in and embolize them. And so you can um, do various uh, techniques to get into those endoleaks and embolize them over time um, to prevent uh, the aneurysm from expanding. So here's an example of a case. This patient had over a year um, an aneurysm which grew almost a centimeter in size uh, in the setting of a type 2 endoleak, which we see posteriorly, and then the next time we saw this person, they had a rupture. So this happens, um, and again, type 2 endoleaks are um, important to always uh, diagnose on the venous phase. You can see here that you have the arterial and the venous phase. You don't really see much on the arterial phase in this patient, whereas in the venous phase, you can see this really big blob of contrast posteriorly. So, so venous phase becomes really critical in these patients to get um, and so it really must be part of your standard um, uh, uh, post-stent protocol. Um, and then um, you need to make sure you're always looking very carefully for these endoleaks. Uh, here's just, I included this case just because it's a really nice example of an intercostal artery endoleak. So you can see that left-hand image, you have this nice little small intercostal artery branch which goes to the aortic aneurysm sac, and then you see this sort of blob of contrast there, arterial phase on the left, venous phase on the right. And this is what you get. You get this very amorphous blob of contrast. And, and again, this puts the patient at risk for further aneurysm progression and then rupture. OK, type 3 endoleak. Um, these are more similar to a type 1 than a type 2. So in this case, remember I'd mentioned that type 1 endoleaks, usually the one, they're the ones that we see on the arterial phase. They're not subtle. Um, they're big blobs of contrast. Type 3, same thing. Arterial phase, not a subtle lesion, a big blob of contrast. And this is because of a hole in the graft. Um, so you think about maybe a hole that was accidentally poked in the graft when they were placing the graft itself because of maybe some catheter that went awry. Or if you have a multi-segment, like um, for instance an aorta plus two iliac limbs, if those things fall apart, um, you can have leakage between the segments of those grafts. These are very uncommon, but occasionally you'll see one, and this is just a really nice example from our teaching file of a case where you have this hole in the uh, graft anteriorly and a blob of contrast that's filling up the aneurysm sac from this type 3 endoleak. Type five or type four, remember we already talked about, that's the one that's not clinically relevant. That's the wall porosity that happens only at the time of graft placement. So then we're gonna to skip to type five. Type five is basically a hidden endoleak. So this is an aneurysm where it is stable to worsening over time. It's not, not getting smaller, but you can't find any endoleak on imaging. And that's called a refractory occult endoleak. These are obviously 
you know, the hardest to deal with because there's nothing for you to treat. So if the management kind of depends a little bit on how stable the aneurysm is, but if it's rapidly expanding, then they would probably have to go to open surgery <clears throat> to fix it, given the fact that they're still at risk for rupture. So this, this example, the patient had a relatively stable aneurysm, uh, only a small increase in diameter, but then the next time we saw them, they came back with a uh, rupture. So um, these uh, type 5 endoleaks are tough, um, and uh, they can um, certainly lead to bad outcomes. This patient fortunately survived. They were able to do a, um, a repair and a fem-fem bypass um, that uh, uh, fixed, fixed up this patient, and they were able to survive the, the rupture. Okay, one note. <clears throat> I want to just make a special note of stenting in the thoracic aorta. Um, so... Um, we talked about descending thoracic aorta, aortic arch. Ascending aorta, basically you never see stents put in the ascending aorta, so you don't need to worry about that. Arch uh, stents are a little tricky. Um, and so the problem with the arch is there's not a lot of room for your stent to have um, to land. Basically not a lot of room for your stent struts to, um, to stick into the aorta. So, um, uh, however, it's pretty common to have aortic arch, and in particular pretty common to have proximal descending thoracic aortic aneurysms. So, so what does one do in that situation? So it turns out that um, what the vascular surgeons and the IR docs have started doing is, is covering up the left subclavian artery. So you occlude the left subclavian artery with your stent, um, and uh, you're um, basically sacrificing that left subclavian artery in order to find enough landing zone for you to cover up, or for you to um, treat, say, a descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. But this can obviously cause problems because the left subclavian artery is, nece is necessary to, right, to supply blood flow to the, to the left upper extremity um, and maybe even some patients through the vert into the, um, into the brain. So don't want to just, just sort of willy-nilly occlude the subclavian artery. So what's done is a left subclavian artery bypass. And uh, what that is basically is you can create a graft that goes from the left common carotid, carotid artery to the left subclavian artery um, and provides flow to the left arm. So I'll show you an example here. This patient had an aneurysm of the proximal descending thoracic aorta through the, through the uh, mid-descending thoracic aorta, shown nicely on these sagittal images. See this complex kind of bilobed aneurysm. There's an arrow pointing to some ulceration in the mural thrombus. And you can also see from that right-hand image that the aneurysm is sitting right up against the origin of the left subclavian artery. So there's really no landing zone here that one can place their stent without actually uh, covering the left subclavian artery origin, and that's what exactly what was done in this case. So the subclavian artery was covered, um, and then a bypass was placed. So you can see here this right-hand volume rendered image shows you where that subclavian um, to left common carotid artery bypass is. Um, and this is a typical appearance, this short little graft. And something to be aware of, if you see a descending thoracic aortic aneurysm look, uh, with, that's been stented, look for this bypass graft. Make sure it's patent. Make sure there's no stenosis at either end. Um, a lot of times we don't even realize it's there because it's not in our typical search pattern. So just make sure, keep it, keep it in mind if you see a descending thoracic aortic graft. Oftentimes, not so much in this case, but oftentimes you'll see that the um, operator, either the surgeon or the IR doc, will have occluded or embolized the proximal uh, uh, proximal aspect of the left subclavian artery, and that's because um, if you leave it patent, it can actually serve as a source of a type 2 endoleak, so you don't want to do that, so you may see that that left subclavian artery origin is embolized, and that's, that's a normal finding. Okay, so we talked about the most common complications in the world of endovascular stents, and that's endoleaks, and in particular, really type 2 endoleaks are going to be the most common things we see. What about less common complications? Um, and we're going to start with stent migration and kinking. So here's a nice example um, from a couple years back. A patient came in who had a really large aneurysm in the abdominal aorta, and you can see from that Im middle image, I think you can appreciate that the top of the stent is not aligned with the top of the aneurysm. So at some point this patient had a stent placed and it was presumably in the correct position and then either because maybe the stent size wasn't perfect for the um, aneurysm or maybe because the aneurysm grew over time the uh, stent basically you know detached from the prox from the more proximal aspect of the aorta and, and um, basically um, slumped down in the uh, aneurysm sac like you see here. The double arrows on the right point to a kink that's now formed um, between the uh, 
uh, components of this aneurysm, which limits flow, and actually not shown here is the left common carotid artery, excuse me, left um, common iliac artery, uh, was completely occluded um, because of this kinking. Um, and so uh, the patient actually had claudication symptoms, and that's why she presented. Um, big problem for this patient is this is a gigantic aneurysm, and right now it's not being treated. You can see that upper left-hand image. You have this unprotected, huge, you know, 10-centimeter aneurysm in the abdominal aorta. Um, so this patient ended up going to open repair. Now, um, stent fracture is probably even a little less common. Um, well, they're both they're both pretty uncommon, fracture and migration. But every once in a while, you see maybe once a year or so a patient with with some sort of stent fracture. This is a case. Um, I believe the patient had had an injury from a motor vehicle accident and a seatbelt injury. And um, the middle part of that stent, you can see, is broken. The middle, top middle image shows you this free edge of the stent floating out there in space. Um, that bottom right-hand sagittal image, I think, really gives you a nice um, impression of what's happening here. The, the limb, the uh, iliac limb there, has been dislocated anteriorly and is no longer in continuity with the more superior portion of the stent. And you can see it has thrombosed over time. So that's a problem, obviously. This is a really dramatic example of stent fracture that came in a year or two ago. The, the patient was completely asymptomatic, just coming in for kind of a routine follow-up. And we were very surprised to see this uh, uh, when, we, when we looked at his images. And you can see that the distal part of the abdominal aortic stent has completely separated from the proximal part and, in fact, has translocated towards the patient's right you know, several centimeters. Um, and so there's no continuity here between the upper and the lower parts of the stent. And at the same time, you can see on the left-hand image, he's got a gigantic aneurysm, um, which is not being treated um, by the stent. And so this is clearly a big problem for the patient. Fortunately, again, he was asymptomatic. There was no you know, evidence of rupture or anything like that. Um, so they're able to take him back in on an elective basis. And believe it or not, the surgeons were able to get in there with some wires and um, get from the proximal part of the stent into the um, <clears throat> iliac artery uh, on the left side and they were able to place this sort of secondary stent within the aneurysm sac that you see here. That stent then supplied the left iliac arteries and then a fem-fem bypass was used to take blood from the left side to the right side. So all in all the patient was able to actually have a good outcome at the end. You can actually see that really really bright contrast on the right side. That's where they um, uh, occluded that um, right-sided stent intentionally to avoid a type 2 endoleak from retrograde flow. Um, and so all in all, after that, those relatively minor procedures, they were able to get the, the patient hooked back up and um, in relatively normal working order um, without uh, risk of rupture. So a common, relatively common problem with uh, stents is branch vessel occlusion, and oftentimes these are anticipated and um, um, accepted as, as, a, as a sort of a, a necessary complication of stent placement. So here's an example. This patient has a small branch vessel to the lower pole of the right kidney, shown on the right-hand image. And when you put your stent in, you're going to cover up that branch vessel and infarct the lower pole of the right kidney. Um, for these cases, this, the operators, they have preoperative vascular mapping. So they're pretty well aware that this is going to happen. Um, and sometimes it's just necessary to, to sacrifice a little bit of the kidney uh, for the greater good of repairing the patient's aneurysm. Um, other times, though, you know, you get a little bit more than, than you bargain for, and you occlude the entire left renal artery, which was the case here, um, and there's no flow to the left kidney. That's a bigger problem, clearly. Um, that was in, um, you know, not intentional. They went back in and put in a stent into the left renal artery to attempt to restore flow, and unfortunately in this case it was uh, not successful. Stent infection, <clears throat> the way you identify this is you just find bubbles in the aneurysm sac, air bubbles. You can accept air bubbles probably out to about, um, you know, I'd say maybe three to four weeks post um, post procedure, but beyond that you really don't want to see any air bubbles, um, and if you do, um, then you basically that is infection until proven otherwise. So um, this case, very dramatic case, big uh, aneurysm, or excuse me, big um, 
uh, abscess surrounding the um, aorta graft with multiple air bubbles, so not really a diagnostic dilemma here. Um, this is an infected graft. Here's um, a, a maybe slightly more subtle example where you have a small amount of air in the aneurysm sac here. This is, you know, even though it's just a small dot of air, this is an infected aneurysm, uh, infected um, graft until proven otherwise. And, and you see that actually on the arterial phase image that the um, infection has been associated with thrombosis of the uh, iliac limbs. So um, this, uh, you know, basically two complications in one in this particular patient. So that really sums up our uh, tour of endovascular repair of aneurysms. Um, and we talked about both the normal appearance as well as um, complications in particular, endo leaks, um, and then these various less common complications such as fracture, infection, and um, uh, branch vessel occlusion. So the next uh, round, we're going to talk about open repair and uh, its appearance. Um, and so I thank you for your attention.